I had a, uh, a thinning crown. I, uh, I was starting to get a bagel, what they call a bagel. I was losing hair all around the side. Never get that. No amount of money in the world could, to get my hair back. And he went, well, actually, there is, uh, there is some places. I was talking about Quentin Chong, someone that we had known for for years back. And he said, Jason, you need to see his hair. It's insane. And I uh, went out to YouTube and found a clip of Quentin. And I just thought, that is amazing. Who did that? Called back to Cape Town, found out that MHR had done it. And decided I would book, a, a book an appointment. Spoke to the gentleman on the phone. And he said, don't book an appointment. Just come down and do it. We're quiet in the books for a change. And trust me, it will never look back. Surgery is done with a mild. These days, even completely bald areas can be restored in one or two sessions. Genetic hair loss affects 80% of the male population, as much as 20% of 20-year-olds, 30% of 30-year-olds, 40% of 40-year-olds, etc., etc., are affected by genetic hair loss. It is a medical condition, just like we inherit asthma or high blood pressure, but we only lose hair in a horseshoe shape on the top of the head. The sides and the back always spared. The little thing that sits inside the skin is called the follicle, and that sits about a half a centimeter beneath the skin. In a genetically predisposed individual, somebody's inherited this either from the mother or the father, or certainly a combination of the two, there's a tiny little thing sitting microscopic in shape on the wall of the follicle called a receptor. And the best way to think of a receptor is like a little lock. Already from the age of 13, 80% of young boys, the hair starts thinning out. What happens at 13? male hormone kicks in. That is very much like a little key that fits specifically into that lock and it causes the hair not just to fall out but it becomes thinner, finer, lighter, shorter, 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 shorter. We call that process miniaturization and eventually it's, it disappears. We don't even notice that disappearing. The hair on the sides and the back develops embryonically in the baby from a different area. It never has that lock. So the hormones there but it can't fit in. So many years ago uh, 35 years ago, they said, well, if this is the good hair on the sides, why don't we take a plug out here and plug it into the front? And lo and behold, the hair grew, but it looked like Don King on Viagra or a sort of Barbie doll look, and it left terrible scars. Now, bearing in mind that was 35 years ago, and the stigma is still attached today. Today, it is a totally natural and undetectable procedure where we do individual single little hairs at a time. The donor hair is dissected into tiny grafts containing two to three hair follicles. These are then grafted into the balding scalp with a minimal depth incision technique. Honestly, I went from having no hairline to having this little hairline. I shaved my head. I didn't mind the fact that I had this big scar on the back of my head. It must have been three months before I realized what work we're going. Have you done something? Have you lost weight? Have you had a tan? You, know, you work it out. And it was purely because all of a sudden I had a little hairline. Uh, as far as scarring is concerned, it's a, it's a long cut to the back of your head, which is back here, which very few men don't grow the hair on the back of their head. Also, the moment you've got hair, you want to grow your hair. So you are going to cover the scar. As far as pain is concerned, there's a short prick in the beginning, straight into your arm. The, uh, the drugs immediately fill you up. And, uh, and you just feel very relaxed, very calm. And there's a, an entire team around you who are constantly repeating the doctor's instructions, who are constantly asking you questions, keeping you alert. And uh, the whole thing just feels very organized. By far, the most important thing is to keep what you've got, to prevent any further hair loss. Once that hair's fallen out, no potions, no lotions, and certainly no laser light can ever bring that hair back. So that's where we come in. So it's really a two-fold uh, procedure. Number one would be to keep what you've got. Number two, replace what you've lost. We do not change a person in any way. We're simply giving back what they had. And the whole idea with a hair transplant is it should be totally natural, totally undetectable. In the wrong hands, it can be a total disaster. If you notice a hair transplant, it's a bad hair transplant. The only transplant ever seen is, is a bad one. A good hair transplant, totally natural, totally undetectable. Not a hair out of place, which means every day is a good hair day. So if you're like me, you've just seen that and gone, oh, I hope that never happens to me. How do I prevent that? Good question. Larry, it's yours. How do we prevent that? Yes, kind having of said that, as you can see, certainly not a painful procedure at all. No, but, I think this yeah. is what people yeah. sort of ha have to see. Lots of things. I always say to every patient, the most expensive treatment is the one that doesn't work. It doesn't matter if you spend a few cents on a dog vitamin, hundreds of rands of shampoos, thousands of rands of lasers. If it doesn't work, you're simply wasting your money. Okay, well, what does work? Well, about 12, 14 years ago, they came out with a tablet called Finasteride, known as Finpecia on the market, and it's certainly the gold standard. It's a preventative drug. 
It's not a testosterone inhibitor in any way, but it rather blocks, we spoke about the little receptors earlier, it blocks those receptors and prevents the hormone attacking the hair. So it's like a pause button on a video machine. It keeps what you got. It prevents any further hair loss. I'm going to make a wild assumption, but that you've been using that for the last 14 years. That is no correct. I've been on it since it came out. Uh, in fact, I, I went on it before it even came out in South Africa. And what would I look like today? More than likely, I wouldn't have a hair on my head. So it really is a preventative disease. You know, I see so many patients that we saw 10 or 12 years ago, and at the time they had the family history, and all I said was, you've got your family history, take the tablet. It's a preventative drug. We see them now, and they look like F.W. de Klerk. And that's really the, the sad part. What about side effects? Drug it's, like that? It's, every tablet's got side effects. You know, you can take a few disprin and kill yourself on a few disprin. Mm -hmm. So having said that, it's an incredibly well-tolerated drug. No nausea, no vomiting, you can mix with other medication, other drugs, no problem. In less than 1% of men, erectile dysfunction, that's decreased desire for sex, a decreased volume of sperm, but it certainly doesn't affect the sperm count. So it's an incredibly well-tolerated drug. Thanks, Larry. Larry certainly is living, walking, hairy proof that prevention is better than cure. Coming up, how to avoid garlic breath and feel full for longer. I want to live the best life.